new organizational structures that we believe will provide for people in the long term. And so what that means for a bread enterprise, for example. Um, well, here, here are all the different breads that I ate when I was growing up. We would go to the store, we would buy all of these, and I thought they were 14 different companies. But what I've learned over the years is that's not 14 small bread companies. That is in many cases one big company. Or basically there are two big companies in the United States that supply most of our bread. So that means that when I go to a local store and I buy any of those breads, my dollar is leaving my community and going to one of these two big companies. So part of the solution is to create many small local bakeries so that my dollar, when I spend it, will stay in my community. And when the dollar, when I spend a dollar in my community, it's more likely to be spent again in my community, and it moves around. And I realized that there's a metaphor I could use. I hope that Google Translate was correct in translating this, but. You probably don't have a lot of pinball machines here, but this is a game that we play a lot in the United States. And it's kind of like our local economy, in that if you imagine that the city of Jeonju is a pinball game, and each one, the money that you put into the pinball machine, um, is the ball that bounces around. When you spend 1,000 won, at a local business, then it's possible or likely that local business will spend it at another local business, and now for the local economy, for the local wealth, it's worth 2,000 won. So we spend it again at different types of local businesses, and the goal is for the ball to not fall down. Because once it goes down, it's gone, and it might not come back, but as long as you keep hitting it back into the local economy, your local wealth, it goes up and up. So, so that's the game that we're playing. That's a goal of creating local economies, is to grow our local wealth. And it's not just to grow the local wealth, but it's also, when the ball does go down, it falls down the bottom, most of the time, it's going to people who already have a lot of money because this is this is wealth inequality in the United States where 93% of the wealth is controlled by just 20% of people so that means that the other 80% of people only have 7% of the wealth and so when it when our money leaves our communities it's going to the people who own the big companies and the people who own the big companies, are they already have enough wealth, I think. So, but the 7% of wealth that we still have is very powerful if we put it to good use. So, so a big question is how can small bread companies really compete with these giant bread companies? And that's where the agreements and the organizations come in. So I'll give you an example of a type of agreement. In the US, we call it Community Supported Agriculture, or CSA. And this is a model where groups of consumers create a relationship with a producer, a farmer, that brings them closer together so that they're sharing many things. So the consumers purchase a share of the harvest, in March, in the advance of the planting season. And in exchange, they'll get a share of the harvest in June, July, August. And in that way, they're sharing in the financing of the farm. It gives the farmer financial support to go forward. They share in the profits, because if it's a good harvest year, they'll get more vegetables. They'll share the risk, because if it's not a good harvest year, they won't get as much. They might share in the work by helping out the farmer 
Uh, the farmer likely shares more information with the consumers and maybe even lets the consumers take part in decision making. So this is just a relationship that you can create with agreements between producers and consumers, which it takes the bread company out of the conventional marketplace and it means we're making decisions on different bases. So here's the agreement. Maybe with a bakery, we can find 100 people. And each person agrees that they will buy one loaf of bread per week for a year. And that guarantees that the farm, or not the farm, the bakery will be successful, at least in the beginning. And in exchange, the bakery can make agreements to support the local community by using local healthy grains, spending a, at least a percentage of the earnings in the local community. So this becomes a relationship that can help a small bread company thrive. But then there are other questions. Are the big companies just gonna come along later and just swallow up? Are they gonna buy the small companies? Because that's what always happens, is a business is successful and then another larger business comes and gives them lots of money and buys out the business. And you also wonder, well, how do we make sure that these companies are going to be good to our communities? It's not just that we want them to succeed, we also want them to support our communities. So how do we do that? So I use, I'm using a grain mill as a metaphor here. Uh, for this is how you make bread in a conventional business. Um, that's, that's what it's supposed to look like. Um, but in a conventional business, you have a lot of inputs. You put in the water, the land, the seeds, and throw them all into the mix. You have workers putting in time. You have consumers putting in money. You sprinkle on a little bit of chemical fertilizer, pesticides, and then you have the shareholders who control the company and make profits. And so they're cranking the wheel around so that they can earn money and that we can eat bread. And what they get is a lot of power and a lot of money. And we have tended to be okay with that because it has given us things that we felt we need, which are food and jobs. So for a long time, this has been the conventional system that people have consented to. Um, but in the US, we started to realize how exploitative this system can be. Almost 100 years ago, our government stepped in and said, wait a minute, workers are working long hours, their lifespan is short. We need to do something to make this system a little bit less exploitative. So we started getting all these regulations. We have employment laws to protect workers. We have securities laws to protect people who invest their money in enterprises. We have consumer protection laws to protect the health of the consumers. And all of these laws are, are like bolts that we're tightening. We're tightening up the system so that it can't be quite as exploitative. But what happens when you start to build a sharing economy? When you start to create small organizations in your local community, like, for example, a small food cooperative. A group of people comes together, they put in time, they put in money, to buy food together and uh, support local farmers and eat healthy food. Look what happens, see right up there, when they try to turn the wheel. They can't turn the wheel. I'll show you one more time. See, they, they can't turn it because the bolts have become so tight. We've had to tighten the laws so much to prevent exploitation by big companies. But we've tightened them so much that a small food cooperative cannot put in time 
the members cannot share the work of running the food cooperative because they have to comply with employment laws. This is how it is in the US. I don't actually know what it's like in Korea, but almost every place that I've traveled so far, Australia, France, England, I've learned that the laws are increasingly like this. So the food cooperative, the members cannot all put their money together. They can't share the funding because of securities laws preventing them from putting their money at risk. And there are health and safety laws that could prevent them from sharing food and cooking for one another. So what we end up with is a system, a legal system in the United States that has prevented us from using our most valuable resources, which is our time, our relationships, our money. Um, we're very limited. But how do we change these laws without creating more exploitation? Here's the answer is that it's actually just a flawed business structure and we need to create business structures that are not designed to exploit. So this is what it looks like. So here's a company where the board is elected by the workers, meaning the workers control the company, they make decisions about the company, and the profits go to the workers. So that's a worker cooperative. You could also have a bread company that's owned by the people who eat bread. So here's a consumer cooperative. And in that case, the profits, if there are any profits, they will go to the people who have been purchasing the bread. You could also create nonprofit, not for profit entities to provide for communities. And in that case, the money is instead of going to workers or consumers, it's going back into the entity. And the, the two really important things to know about cooperatives and not-for-profits is that money cannot buy power and money cannot buy profits. Meaning, money doesn't control everything. People control everything. Because if money controlled everything, then the wealthiest 20% of society would control everything. So it's so important that we begin to build an economy based on cooperatives and not-for-profits, as opposed to for-profit businesses. Because this is the for-profit commercial business. It's designed to extract as much from workers and from consumers as possible. It gives as little as it can back to the community. And it grows the wealth of people who are already wealthy. Compare that to a cooperative, which cycles the wealth back into our community. It's designed to protect our communities and provide for them because our communities control them. And it's designed to give as much back to the community as it possibly can. And what it does is it puts wealth back. It gives wealth back to the 80% and it grows. That 7% of wealth can grow. So this is where we begin to build two economies side by side and two different legal systems side by side. We need regulations to protect us against commercial businesses, uh, to keep them from exploiting our communities. And we need different regulations and different incentives for cooperatives and not-for-profits because their design, their inherent legal design, is to provide for communities. So we should give them tax incentives, we sh our cities should provide funding, should provide physical spaces, and any other kind of support for cooperatives and not-for-profits. So, just to emphasize, we can't change the economy unless we begin to build cooperatives and not-for-profits. 
And we can't change the legal system either because we can't start to loosen the regulation unless we do it for cooperatives and nonprofits. So that's the true sharing economy. It's an economy built on entity, entity structures that are designed to provide for us and built on agreements that bring us together, bring producers and consumers together to share and to collaborate. Thank you.